everybody. Uh, this is the podcast dedicated to sleep apnea. And, uh, I say we two are working in this field for a long time now. I am the disciple, he is a guru. Let me introduce ourselves. Uh, I am Dr. Anupam. I am uh, working in sleep apnea for last one year. And uh, he is my mentor, Dr. Srinivas Kishore, who is in this field for last 17 years. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. So, it's a great honor to be here and uh, recording this very special podcast with you, sir. Thank you. And uh, I'd say we are both on a mission to change the awareness and uh, the understanding of sleep apnea in this country. Yes. So, uh, the purpose of this podcast will be to talk about uh, sleep apnea and its very basic understanding and uh, make uh, the layman aware of what this problem is all about how it can be treated, how it can affect your day-to-day -day life. So, sir, we all have been through that train journey where we have seen one uncle who is snoring and disturbing the whole coach. But snoring is not uh, what worries us, right? It's the consequences of that snoring. So, what is your take on it, sir? So, I think gone are those days when uh, we used to take snoring very lightly or when I very clearly remember in my childhood, if somebody was sleeping and snoring, it was considered a, a kind of a satisfied sleep. But now we know, uh, there was a work, tremendous work that have been done in the last two and uh, two and a half decades, that snoring is no longer uh, uh, a measure of satisfied sleep. In fact, it is the contrary. When you say snoring, what you are really talking about is a condition wherein the sleep is getting disturbed because of inability of the person or, or his uh, or there is a flow limitation or what we call as increased work of breathing on the and the burden on that particular person's lung to take oxygen into his lungs. So, snoring is a sound that is generated by the person when there is a partial airway obstruction. So, if a person is having airway obstruction, it is like choking, That except that nobody external is choking you, you are choking on yourself. And the end result is the plethora or a uh, myriad of conditions that follow as a consequence of this disturbed breathing or inability of the lung to get enough oxygen into itself and hence its inability to give that oxygen to the vital organs of the body. So it is not a, uh, a satisfying sleep uh, at all. So I think uh, the misconception is still pretty much uh the brains and hearts of uh, our public that snoring is a sign of deep, deep sleep. However, it's not right and uh, snoring is a sign of very poor sleep when your body is actually struggling to get air inside your body. And many times we do see people having that spell of uh, when they stop breathing altogether during sleep, which is called an apnea event. And hence the condition is called sleep apnea in medical terms. So, uh, sir, we have seen a lot of studies. We have seen Dr. Patel Benjati talk about it. He has said that 52 million Indians suffer from snoring and sleep apnea. Then there was Dr. Deja Suis paper from AIDS which said that 104 million Indians are suffering from sleep apnea. And now we have Dr. Abhishek Gur's paper from AIDS Bhopal which estimates the prevalence of OSC in India to be about 30%. So do you agree with all this data? This is a staggering number. I mean, if we can go back to uh, sort of zoom out the whole thing and look at a from India from a global perspective, um, there's a very good paper that got published, I think, in uh, early uh, 2000, uh, uh, I think somewhere between uh, 2010 to 2015. I don't remember the exact uh, uh, so, what they have done is they have actually done the prevalence studies 
in US, China, Australia, and India. Uh, and a management paper. Now, that particular paper put us at around 52 million. But if you look at the percentage, uh, you will see that India is at 7% of all Indians have sleep apnea, which is much more than Chinese or maybe uh, our, our immediate neighbors, wherein if you are looking at 7% of our vast population, you are looking at staggering numbers here. And what is more interesting in that paper is the fact that women constitute to 4% of sleep apnea in India. And as opposed to any other country which constituted only 2 to 3%. And sleep apnea in women is a completely different condition manifesting differently the patients complain to us differently and they don't have the same kind of manifestation of the same disease so here gender plays a significant role and women for that matter have been i think have been a forgotten sex when it comes to management or evaluation or uh, treating uh, sleep apnea. Coming back to the new data that uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, who actually uh, published this mind blowing data, is I think he's going to publish it very, uh, very, uh, uh, I think in the next few months. And we had the fortune, uh, uh, pleasure of listening to it during our uh, conference last month in July. These numbers are mind blowing, and I think. I've been in this practice for quite some time to sort of believe that. It's just that people, you can't ask the same question. So if you think, is this data too big? I say, I don't think so. Because sleep apnea is a, a, is a, is a wolf in a sheep's clothing. And it will change its dress differently when it manifests to different people. For example, to an ENT, like you and me, patient with sleep apnea would present as snoring. The sleep apnea is a label that you are giving to that particular patient. But how is the patient presenting to you, to an ENT like you and me, they are presenting with snoring. And then of course you would ask further questions and lead you into the diagnosis of sleep apnea. If you look at to a patient, uh, who might go to a cardiologist. In, when it comes to a cardiologist, the sleep apnea wears the dress of arrhythmia or wears the dress of uncontrolled hypertension requiring more than three drugs. Or uh, uh, for a patient with uh, who, who's uh, uh, to a pulmonologist, sleep apnea wears the dress of respiratory failure. And for a neurologist, Sleep apnea wears the dress of uncontrolled uh, migraine. And so this is actually a condition which does not present to you just by its face value, but it wears different dresses and present to different specialities. So it is upon us as clinicians, as, as caregivers, to sort of try and understand what clothing is this particular wearing this time of. I think it's high time that we introduce the sleep history in our history taking practice. Yes. As all clinicians. And uh, this should be a mandate that uh, we ask their sleep behavior and their patterns of sleep so that they, we don't miss out on the important one third life. Absolutely. That we all spend in bed. We do ask a lot of history regarding the life that we spend as awakened individuals, but we don't spend too much time asking about the history that the person sleeps uh, and uh, spends in bed. So I think this should become a mainstream amongst all the doctors to ask uh, how the patients sleep, like especially for uh, associations that we are already aware of, like you said, arrhythmias and yes. Uh, uncontrolled hypertension, neurological problems, migraine, sleep should be a mainstream. Okay. And uh, seeing these figures which are mind-blowing as you said sir, 
this should be a major public health concern, right? So, uh, Fortunately, uh, I think this is uh, where we have to really pull up our socks because if you are looking at that kind of numbers and again, there is a beautiful article that got published by Lancet Respiratory Medicine in uh, 2019 um, about the global burden of sleep apnea. It's 900 million people who require uh, management again. It is sleep apnea, which is the common denominator for so many different conditions. So as you correctly pointed out, in fact, I will bring in another sort of a metric of measure. And I was talking about women and sleep apnea. And it has been now known and understood that a lot of infertility in women, maybe because of uh, improper sleep, poor sleep hygiene, and having sleep apnea and people turn so much attention to uh, to infertility not understanding what could be a probable mechanism that is resulting in this particular problem i think the focus has to be more on understanding why this particular condition came and in most of these major conditions take stroke take uh, myocardial infarction for that matter all of these conditions may actually have either sleep apnea as a major driving force or it may be one of the factors that is actually contributing to this um, as a driving force to the uh, actual diseases that we are talking about. What we are talking about is an end stage. End stage of, and this is something that we were just discussing before we uh, got on to the uh, talk this uh, morning uh, about uh, how each uh, uh, patient sort of manifests differently with, um, uh, with the underlying mechanism. So it is the mechanism that is important that we uh, figure out and try to manage because uh, if you just scrape the surface by just treating the condition, not understanding the mechanism why this is happening, we would just treat the symptoms and that is no better than, tre than treating a condition uh, uh, like an RMP would. So, one of my professors at Ames once told me that for every condition, you have to ask a series of five boys. A person is coming to you with stroke, you need to buy, ask why did this happen? Your answer will probably be a hypertension or a cholesterol. And then you need to ask another why. Why did this hypertension and hypercholesterolemia happen to this patient? Probably because of his dietary habits or smoking. Why is this patient smoking altogether? Probably because he just needs to stay awake because he's not getting enough sleep at night. Blame it all on uh, smoking, smoking and hypertension and all these things without realizing that the person is actually sleep deprived and probably is just smoking up to uh, stay awake during the day. I think this is a very important topic that we normally or seldom discuss and from is the fact that sleep is as important as being awake. Um, it is more important, more important because you are oblivious to what is happening to you inside. Yet, and if I have to quote uh, Matthew Walker, one of the uh, great scientists in sleep, uh, he says, it is actually, uh, sleep is a mechanism through, your, uh, through which your system reboots. And if you are depriving your body of a system reboot because of your inability to breathe properly, you are actually messing up with the only way your body needs to compensate for whatever you are putting through during the, that particular individual's day time. So it's like running a mobile without a uh, battery charger or you are running a car without petrol. So Absolutely. It's the fuel that your body needs. Exactly. And here we are thinking of the... In See, and again, I would like to quote my dear friend uh, Jeevna Jayendra from uh, Kuala Lumpur. He says that you are sending your car for service all the time and you are looking at whether the wiring is good, 
the engine is working well or no, all the dials are working well or no. But have you really thought about how the fuel is going in, how the fuel is, what have we done for that? The fuel is breathing. Fuel of the car is breathing for a human being. Breathing is something which is quintessential for the existence of any human life. It's A, B, C, right? This is what we are taught in BLS. And airway and breathing and then circulation. And of the three, two are concerned with airway and oxygen. And if you are not providing A and B, C does not uh, matter. Doesn't happen. So, uh, I remember one of the very famous uh, EATs talking about it on a podium and saying, you can go without uh, water for maybe a day or two. You, you have heard stories where people lived, for, lived without food on hunger strike for days, hundreds of days. Then uh, just uh, spend a minute or two without oxygen. How does it feel? Exactly. You can't do that. It's a sea at all levels. And it's not that breathing during sleep is an important. Breathing during sleep is probably more important than breathing during the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, sir, uh, sleep apnea is basically lying on the spectrum of sleep related breathing disorders. Which is a huge spectrum, I must say. And uh, this, uh, sleep apnea is one of the uh, extreme stages of sleep related breathing disorders that we see. So, what exactly are the types of sleep related breathing disorders that you are aware of and you want to share it with our viewers, with our public? So, sleep apnea is, a, as you correctly said, is one of the main sleep disorders okay there are 38 sleep disorders of which sleep apnea is a very important uh, condition amongst those disorders so sleep uh, obstructive sleep apnea comes under a umbrella term for sleep related breathing disorders which basically encompass primary snoring that means he only snores and he is a problem only for the sleeping partner or probably somebody else in this house. Social snoring, which we actually uh, see very commonly. The problem is from the next few. Where in the next stage of conditions, this is called upper airway resistance syndrome. Now, whether upper airway resistance syndrome is an independent entity or a part of obstructive sleep apnea, we really don't know. But Upper airway resistance syndrome is a condition where there is snoring, but the air that does that reaches the person's lung doesn't come easy. The person has to work hard to get that oxygen into the lung. And that condition is called upper airway resistance syndrome. Without uh -huh. now. The effort that the person is putting in to get the oxygen can cause aerosols. And in this particular condition, the problem for the patient will be only excessive daytime sleepiness and nothing else. Why? Maybe because of the limitation of air or the work of breathing to get that oxygen into the lungs. Just, uh, just for clarification, what is excessive daytime sleepiness just for our... Absolutely. I think what I'll do is, I will finish the other two and come to uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. I think, so primary snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea and the last condition called obesity hypoventilation syndrome, or also known as OHS in common terms and this is the condition which is like an emergency because the patient is actually retaining carbon dioxide during the day itself. So, a condition which was necessarily only in the night now becomes a awake breathing disorder. Now, when sleep apnea or when sleep related breathing disorders manifest, they manifest because of two end products that happen because of the condition. 
One, you call it neurobehavioral symptoms. That's a broad uh, heading. And the second broad heading is cardiopulmonary. Whatever happens, these two are the main manifestations of whatever is going on inside you because of inability to breathe. Into intake and the effort you are putting in to get that oxygen into the lung. Now, if a person has decreased airflow going in, it causes stress. This stress results in multiple issues, which we will dwell into a little uh, deeper, further into. But this stress will manifest the next day in the form of a very troublesome symptom called excessive daytime sleepiness. And I am sure all of us have had this during our lifetime. Uh, you have you've done night outs as a medical student. We know what happens the next day. There and all our international flights come late in the night. You have to go and pick up your uncle, your aunt, your mom, your dad in an airport at 2 a.m. The next day gets affected. Now, if this is a one-off thing for us, but sometimes you will have to, if this is happening on a daily basis for months together, the next day, all the stress that you have accumulated in the night for having limited airflow into your lung and having to work hard to get that airflow into the lung, this stress manifests as what we call as excessive daytime sleepiness. This is a very, very important manifestation of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, is excessive daytime sleepiness unique to obstructive sleep apnea? No. It can be to many other conditions, for example, narcolepsy. But that we are looking at a very different condition. Let's stick to. But excessive daytime sleepiness is a very, very important symptom of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So, excessive daytime sleepiness patients should always be asked about snoring complaints and I think in the presence of snoring, we should assume it to be a sleep apnea case and uh, treat it as such in the absence of any other uh, apparent symptoms. Absolutely. I think it can be somewhere in that spectrum, not social snoring, but it could be excessive daytime sleepiness resulting either from Upper airway resistance syndrome. The very beautiful thing about upper airway resistance syndrome is the body has adapted so beautifully that there is no oxygen deprivation to the body. But the condition makes you work hard to get oxygen into the body. So you are basically getting tired of breathing. And that manifests in the next day as uh, excessive data. Sleep related breathing disorder is like the car is running at double the speed when it should adequately be taking some rest. So you are working at uh, double the efforts at night. That's why you feel the side effects, the after effects of it on the next day, being excessively tired, excessively sleepy. And, uh, this condition can only be taken care of if you sort out the pain of the patient. Absolutely. And and I really like this analogy because the car is going fast, you are pressing the accelerator, but you are not reaching the destination, unfortunately. So, destination being having a restful sleep, destination being enough oxygen into the body. So, in spite of all this work, so it's like one of those old cars which makes a lot of noise, but it, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, during our childhood we used to have these steam engines, which makes a lot of sound, but it doesn't go fast at all. It's not going anywhere. It's extremely poor efficiency. Efficiency, I think you nailed it. Ultimately, it uh, affects your system. So, what, uh, whatever knowledge that we have from sleep apnea studies, we can predict that in this case, this person will probably have his life cut short by 10 or 20 years if it doesn't go to, uh, undergo treatment for sleep apnea. Absolutely. Your compensations would fail. So, uh, so, what do you think are the prime causes? What 
makes a person snore so heavily, get oxygen deprived, and then undergo excessive daytime sleepiness, tiredness the next day. What is the main cause? Why does it happen? So, for this, we need to understand the behavior of the upper airway during sleep. Right? So, what is happening during the so sleep is a like we spoke about. Sleep is a condition where your body wants to reboot itself. So, there are certain parts of the body that's awake. There are certain parts of the body that would like to sleep. Now, before we go in a little further, I would like to bring this, uh, and, uh, this condition, for example, which is uh, sleep apnea, is very unique to human beings and bipedals, if you look at birds or our early mammals, the larynx, which is the which is the voice box, which is lower down in the neck, is actually just behind the nose. So the food pipe and the wind pipe are totally separate. But since evolutionarily we had to stand up, we had to communicate, we had to vocalize, the larynx had to come down and Mother Nature brought a beautiful muscular pipe called the pharynx connecting the nose to the voice box. This pharynx is a very pliable sort of tube which gives our voice various modulations, various articulations which was necessary for our ancestors to communicate. And to survive. And to survive because we have already, uh, we have always lived in a tribe, we have always lived in a group. So communication was the key in early days. Yes. That's all we human beings evolved. Exactly. So with, uh, uh, I mean, with, uh, see, thing is, as evolution passed, the pharynx, so if you look at uh, this particular muscular uh, tube that we are talking about, this not only allows you to add quality to the voice that you said, but it's the same pipe through which food should go in. It's the same pipe through which your air should go in because this is connecting the behind of your nose to your voice box. Now, this is such a fantastic cue that it should keep itself open when a person wants to breathe and it has to compress. And food has to be sent into the food pipe. Now, if this particular airway, which we are calling as pharynx, which is a muscular tube, is unable to keep itself open for various reasons, and we'll get into that, that results in inability of air to go into the lung. So, problems with the inability of or problems with the air's inability to go into the uh, lung because of the upper airway collapsing at the level of the pharynx is one of the commonest causes of this sleep related breathing disorder. Now, but the airway as we know starts right from the nose. So, there can be obstructions anywhere right from the nose to the voice box to the lung which can cause problems in terms of breathing yes. but the commonest the 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 hotbed or, or the 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 place where most of the activity happens is at the level of the pharynx because any problem happening lower down the level of the pipe or uh, below that will cause a problem during awake stage also that's yes. a visit to you Yes. It's the pliable, collapsible tube of pharynx which uh, loses its tone during sleep and collapses on itself. And uh, in case uh, any person has any tendency to have this collapse, they will develop snoring and sleep apnea. And I think uh, we can make a very bold statement through this podcast that any sort of snoring needs to be evaluated by a person by a professional doctor, a professional ENT surgeon and a pulmonologist. What do you say? Absolutely. I think like we started off uh, in the introduction, snoring is something that 
see body is trying to cry out with uh, for help right it is up to us as caregivers to identify this symptom see if a person has fever don't you take care of it if the person has breathing issues having wheeze the person is having inability to move a joint don't you take care of it similarly body is trying to throw out a symptom to you it's up to us to evaluate it and it's it's up to the person who is having that problem to get himself evaluated the body is trying to tell you something and pay attention to it so it should not be taken lightly at all this especially if it is being accompanied with tiredness excessive daytime sleepiness but any of the cardiac or blood pressure problems just cannot be avoided you might be in a in, in an abyss and you might need uh, somebody to pull you out of that correct so uh, what do you think are the risk factors associated uh, with snoring and sleep apnea what do you think he disposes a person to being a sleep apnea so um when you say that i think this plays a significant role in this uh, um so for example if you have an occasion if you have a mongoloid race if you have us some patients all of us have different all of us are not made the same way evolution has had their, had had its uh, way and in in sort of structuring us differently now if you take any disease for that matter the way it presents or it manifests in different races is different if you have the uh, uh the african you have the mongoloid you have the caucasian which are the main groups and we have here in in south asia which basically uh india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka we have a very unique mixed gene pool and this is a uh, uh, the title of a talk that i actually presented at the american academy where how indians or south asians have a unique way of manifesting the sleep apnea without being fat now so that brings us to the first question that are all patients with snoring and sleep apnea fat no they aren't so if the way uh, obesity presents uh, or manifests itself in different amongst different races is different for example if you take a caucasian in if you look at a caucasian's body silhouette it's universally like if the person is obese it would be a cylinder right if you look at the the uh, the mongoloid race they are thin lean but they are skeletally challenged and then you have us which are which is a unique mix of all races together but what is the common denominator for us we are all pairs right we have central obesity yes. that is the reason why most of the metabolic conditions are higher amongst us south asians with a lower bmi than Say for the Caucasian with a high. So if you match BMI to BMI and you match uh, uh, metabolic syndrome to that particular BMI, we as South Asians are more vulnerable to the metabolic conditions um, than the Caucasian race. Hence, the disease burden is higher for us because of. the skeletal overloading happening at the level of the center we are pairs so coming to your primary question what are the commonest causes for factor sleep apnea one it can be divided into factors that are external and internal right external can be just obesity it could be central obesity or it could be generally the entire person being obese what obesity does unfortunately is it increases the oxygen demand for the individual so there is already a hunger that the fat 
in the body is now competing with your vital organs for oxygen. Yes. So, here is a phenotype of an individual that means a particular type of patient who wherein the obesity is driving the sleep related breathing disorder. It's accumulated in the upper neck region and causes the flying sleep to Exactly. And we call them parapharyngeal fat pads. So, one, in one place they are choking your supply and the other place they are increasing the demand. So, the yes. fat cells are a double edged sword. Double edged sword. Cutting you from both the edges. Both the edges. Now, if you have then obesity in the abdomen, if you breathe in, so and I would uh, actually uh, ask all our uh, uh, people who are there to actually take a good deep breath. Okay, we take a good deep breath. What is happening to the diaphragm? The diaphragm has to push down to expand the lung. Correct, and that is the right way to breathe. Diaphragmatic breathing is the right way to breathe. But what is below the ab uh, diaphragm? The abdomen. And if your belly is filled with fat or you have a very weak abdominal wall and the contents are all collapsing out, now where is the space for the diaphragm to expand? So here is the situation where the parapharyngeal fat pads are not entering your airway, which is making a circular airway an electrical airway. Your oxygen demand is increasing because of the fat requirement. Three, your lung now wants to pull all that air, but it is not able to expand because of the, the belly. So, unfortunately, we are in a situation where you want more, but you can't get more. So, obesity, I would definitely say is one of the uh, causes. leading causes, but is obesity the only factor that causes the problem? Definitely no. So, if you put obesity on one corner of the spectrum, and on the other corner, they are people with all kinds of skeletal issues. I mean, nature doesn't make everybody the same. Based on genetic factors, based on various other factors, which is the which is beyond the scope of this particular cast. Uh, People may be skeletally challenged in terms of facial bones, in terms of uh, the way the airway is uh, with that particular skeletal structure. So, if you have a very challenged skeleton, that also can cause the upper airway to be very narrow. Of the paper wherein you published about the jaw and the sand and the straw model. Yes. Wherein the size of the jar, the weight of the sand, and the size of the straw, they all are in harmony with each other in a normal person. Yes. But in a skeletally challenged patient who has a narrow jar, a narrow skeletal framework, the straw obviously will become narrow. Absolutely. And the obese patient can be compared to the uh, gravel instead of the sand, which is putting more pressure on the straw. And uh, again, the worst possible scenario is when both of them coexist and it's a small jar with coarse gravel in it and these patients have to be tackled right away at very young age. And unfortunately, for us, any disease, right, they don't come with these stickers on their forehead saying, I am the fatty type, I am the skeletal type. They come in all kinds of permutations and combinations. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, a very interesting mix of people would be people having obstructions in the pipe that we spoke about. It could be an obstruction in the nose, it could be an obstruction in the form of tonsils, in the pharynx, it could be lingual tonsils which are static obstructions sitting on the tongue. And if you have this kind of a problem, Obviously, the upper airway is compromised again. So, if uh, I can tell my viewers, tell our viewers about that physics formula which talks about the flow of a fluid through a pipe, for Poisio's equation, 
it says that the flow of the liquid directly depends on the pore power of radius of the uh, lumen. Yes. The cross section of the tube. Yes. Any sort of obstruction in the nose or in the upper pharynx will cause the flow to go down by one by the, the fourth, fourth power. Fourth power. So uh, if, uh, if your, uh, the radius of the tube decreases by half, your flow goes down to one by sixteen. Sixteenth, exactly, and. That increases the burden on the lung. So uh, ultimately, we see that patient manifesting cardiopulmonary yes. uh, sequences, the uh, cardiopulmonary sequelae of the same problem, uh, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillations, all the uh, you can say the uh, ventricular hypertrophies, uncontrolled hypertension, all that sequelae come in much later. Exactly. In fact, the way all this manifests is through stress, right? And ultimately, how does stress manifest? In three particular ways. Number one, it stimulates the hypothalamo-pituitary axis. And if hypothalamo-pituitary axis gets stimulated, the only way it can respond is by releasing cortisol, which is a steroid. Right? And the consequences that happen because of excess cortisol release. So, does stress mean only the kind of psychological stress no. that a common man knows about? No. Stress is any stress onto the body, body. Onto the physical system, which can be a lack of oxygen itself. So, see, human being for that matter, is still, I mean, if you look at, this is how a animal would respond. It will still get its HPA axis uh, uh, get activated and release cortisol. Or the second way how human body uh, sort of responds to physical stress in the form of increased work of breathing is the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic overdrive. So the lung is trying to pull air. So what happens inside the thorax? Is the there is what is called an increased intrathoracic negative pressure. Now, this negative intrathoracic pressure causes what we call as autonomic dysfunction and sympathetic overdrive. Sympathetic overdrive again comes with its own bag of problems. And number three, all of this will actually also affect the way your immunity works. The cells of your body, your WBC cell, because a whole bunch of cytokines are released in response to stress, in response to oxygen not going into the body properly. And the, the effect of this irrational cytokine release and uh, abnormal function of your cells and the retention of oxygen and hypoxia, I mean, Retention of carbon dioxide in the body will cause these symptoms that we talk about and the manifestations that it can do. So to sum it up, obesity, skeletal dysfunction and any obstructions in the upper airway, these three are the primary causes of sleep apnea, the yes. obstructive sleep apnea variant that we are talking about. Yes. And these three are responsible for most of the snoring, daytime sleepiness, and the sleep deprivation that one can get, the lack of oxygen that one can get at night, they lead to a cascade of events that we just talked about, where body undergoes a lot of stress and uh, releases a lot of stress hormones like steroids to deal with that stress. And in turn, since the uh, release of these stress hormones leads to the whole cascade of events, the cardiopulmonary sequelae that we uh, right. just talked about in the previous section. Yes. So, this brings down the immunity, this brings down your lifespan, this yes. brings down your attention. What kind of a life you have? In fact, there is, a, uh, there is a literature to quote that once a person is diagnosed to be having structural sleep apnea, your, your uh, average lifespan has come, come down to 58 years, which is almost 20 years than the global average of your actual lifespan. So it is not smoking or substance abuse or whatever. In fact, 
snoring and obstructive sleep apnea if diagnosed to be in that particular individual will reduce your life to a your average age of about 58 years so probably it is one of the most important public health problems as we yeah. talked about about 900 million to a thousand million individuals currently are suffering from it waiting to be treated yes uh, simultaneously a huge burden of these individuals are residing in our very own country right. uh, in our very own niche if we extrapolate the global averages probably as of now about 30 to 40 crore individuals in our country are suffering from this problem and we don't see any government initiatives, any public health initiatives in this regard. So, well, uh, if you remember, we had this very interesting uh, fireside chat at our conference last month and we sort of brought up all these. Uh, the problem here is Anipur, that um, government wants data, right? And, and very much so, they need data because they are policy makers and policy cannot be just based on some frivolous things, just you and me speaking, it doesn't happen that way. Now the problem here is to get data, you need to sort of uh, uh, get extract that particular uh, information from a particular individual. The problem here is that because sleep apnea wears different clothes and manifests differently with different specialities, so it is totally slipping between our hands and not coming into the, uh, the grasp of us because we are not able to sort of find out which clothing it is wearing at that particular time. So if you know that you are, okay, it is you are there, then we will catch you but then this manifests so differently that we are not able to pick it up. So the way out is to make the general practitioner, a pediatrician yes. and uh, all the pulmonary medicine, general medicine people aware about this problem. Yes. Probably all the ENTs, the dentists who are regularly dealing with all the upper airway issues make sure that they take sleep history from their patients. Yes. All the cases. I would actually add the, the role, uh, the pivotal role that a general physician, a neurologist, a cardiologist and uh, ENTs can take. Now we are in the medical fraternity, right? But there is a huge, huge chunk of patients who actually present to the dental fraternity. Dental fraternity actually see these things, but they don't look at it in our way because they don't present to them. In fact, if there is something as a take home message that uh, I would like to give today is for the dental fraternity to sort of understand how sleep related breathing disorder or dysfunctional breathing manifests in these patients in the form of crowded teeth, um, dental malocclusions, PMJ, Bruxism problem and I'm sure we're going to talk about all these things but uh, these are the symptoms that with which patients go to uh, our dental uh, our colleagues and sometimes what the mind knows is what the eyes see. So you don't know about it, you don't pick it up and hence it's the patient's loss unfortunately and as caregivers of uh, patients suffering from this dreadful condition, we, I think, uh, owe it up to our patients that we need to educate them, educate our colleagues, educate our peers in all fields of medicine to identify these patients and do what is right. We are uh, identifying the symptoms of sleep apnea in our patients. Suppose as a medical student, I am asking you, how to proceed further, sir? What do we suggest our patients? How do we diagnose sleep apnea? So, sleep apnea is not a, 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 a simple condition that you can put a thermometer in a person's mouth or do a simple blood test, even though we would love to have such a thing like a biomarker that can, and there's a lot of, absolutely, if you can get a biomarker for uh, sleep, yes, even though people are working very hard and we are not there yet. So, till that comes in, we need to do a, a study called, uh, in, in common man's term, called 
sleep study. Now, sleep study is the metric through which we measure severity of sleep apnea. What is the other name for sleep study? Polysomnography. Poly means multiple. Somno means sleep. Graphy is recording. Now, ECG is electrocardiography. Similarly, polysomnography is a recording of a person's sleep. In fact, polysomnography is actually a master health checkup for a person's sleep. Like how normally we go to labs and hospitals and get master health checkups done. This is a master health checkup for your sleep because so much is happening during a person's sleep and you are not even aware of what is happening. So it's very prudent that we actually identify this and try to get the data from a person's sleep. What exactly do we want to know in sleep, sir? What metrics do we look at when a person is sleeping? So, sleep polysomnography can be actually at four, there are about four types of polysomnography. The first two are actually proper polysomnography. That means you are actually recording sleep and tallying it with every other measure that is happening in the body. For example, your position, the effort that your lung is putting in, the limitation of airflow that's going into your body, the effect of it on the heart, so on and so forth. So the level one and two, the first two types are called polysomnography. I think, sir, we, uh, you misunderstood my question. Uh, I was uh, referring to what are the metrics we look at. Ah, when you do polysomnography. Levels, correct. So, in polysomnography, we are looking primarily at seven or eight parameters. These are mandatory parameters that we need to assess to understand what is going on with that particular person who is having this particular problem. So, you start off with EEGs, which, you, which are basically electrodes that are put on a person's scalp to record the brain activity. Number two, you do a EMG, which is a muzzle activity. You are measuring the amount of airflow through the nose. Then you are looking at the effort that the thorax is actually putting in to get air into the body. Then you are actually measuring the pulse of the particular patient. And there are leads that are actually telling you the position of this particular patient. So, a conglomeration of all this data is actually recorded in a person's, uh, 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 in this client overnight and presented to you as a sleep apnea study report, also called as polysomnography. Because every stage has a different muscle tone and muscle activity yes. going on in the body. Yes. Stages of the sleep are muscle tone goes down and causing the pliable collapsible pharynx to do. Okay. Which is collapse on itself, give you a choking event. Absolutely. And the behavior of the collapsible pipe that we are talking about, as you correctly said, is different for different individuals at different stages of sleep. Basically, depending on the amount of collapsibility of the upper airway. Now, for me, it might happen only in N2 sleep. For you, it may only happen in N3 sleep. Now, it's very interesting that you bring about uh, uh, muscles and, and uh, paralysis of the muscles because REM sleep or dream sleep is a fascinating stage in a person's sleep. It is, it is a, uh, it is what uh, Mother Nature has actually devised for you because if you look at the brain activity during that particular stage of sleep, it is very similar to a person being awake. Right? The brain activity is filled with electrical data, with, with, uh, with, uh, with electrical charge, which is activity. The brain is the bus with activity as much as when you are a person, when you are awake, but if you look at the muscles, 
and that is a fantastic thing that evolution has done as a safety check for you otherwise imagine you are a cave you are a you are a you are a soldier or uh, let me say uh, you are having a bad dream of somebody beating you up and if somebody is beating you up what is the retaliation you want to hit somebody and you are actually going through that that dream and you feel hurt your sleeping partner if your muscles are not paralyzed yes. what's going to happen if you look at the evolution right our forefathers were were tree dwellers right and if uh, if something would have actually uh, happened and you would start doing this when you are a tree dweller or sleeping on a branch what would happen you would fall and you would hurt yourself it's you probably will give up your location to the predator when they would come and eat you up it's also i'm reminded of one story that i read in my physiology book during medical school sir one of the very famous painters I'm forgetting his name he used to sleep with a paint brush in his hand during the rain sleep and his muscles got paralyzed he should drop the brush into the pan and the sound would uh, wake him up and at that time he used to paint his dreams yeah waking up from his sleep so this fantastic muscles coordination with the brain the cardiac activity it's a fantastic chapter all yes. together yes yes perhaps uh, we can record it in, in a separate, in a separate uh, yes yes day. yes so what exactly are we worried about of sleep which stage worries you the most sir is it the rem sleep and muscle syndrome of paralysis is it when your pharyngeal muscles upper airway muscles relax and they just uh, predisposes uh, the patient to sleep apnea so here what is happening is your brain is the boss it's trying to control the upper airway but your upper airway may inherently lack the capability to keep itself open right and the body tries to compensate by putting in other dilator muscles into action trying desperately to open up a collapsible pipe yes now if that muscle responsiveness is not great if in a particular stage of sleep because your airway is paralyzed you are not able to open the upper airway during that phase you are absolutely putting yourself at a danger of not being able to open the upper airway so hence because in dream sleep your muscles are paralyzed there is a very high chance that these things can happen during dream sleep or also known as rem sleep however this can happen at any stage of sleep so sleep study will give us a holistic picture of what is happening to the patient what is happening to the muscles the cardiorespiratory system and the brain correct this is all we want to know during our sleep study so Should we talk next? Sleep uh, hygiene. Should we uh, uh, talk to management, or should we talk about consequences of sleep apnea? Yeah, let's talk about consequences if we don't treat. So, shall we talk about levels of sleep? I'll be leave it. No, it's a bit too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll talk about sleep hygiene. Ready, Robert? So we have talked so much about sleep apnea. So we have talked so much about oxygen, the right way of breathing, the right way of sleeping, and the associated with sleep apnea. So, what advice do you have for a normal person who doesn't snore, but who are the other sleep-related issues? Who comes to you asking? How can I get rid of this uh, uh, sleep problems? How do I prevent converting into a sleep apnea patient? So, what advice do you have for such patients? So, primarily, what you have asked is uh, a simple kind of uh, 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 
uh, an answer what we call as sleep hygiene right now sleep hygiene is something and going back to a love quoting history um the modern man because of the uh, the advent of the electric bulb uh peace born upon him but i think uh the most important thing is that because of the invention of the light and because we have in the in the industrialized era people started uh, living very differently they treat themselves differently we challenge ourselves differently in fact there is um, there is so much of uh, uh, shift sleep disorders that we are dealing with nowadays so what is happening here here is what is happening is that you are not allowing your physiological sleep to happen in the way that it wants to be so because of your habits you have changed the way that your body wants to function in terms of sleep so you see a lot of our patients coming to us saying that i'm just not falling asleep and falling asleep but i'm not able to maintain sleep so these two are the commonest causes for um, a problem which we actually call insomnia now that's a different condition altogether but to put it in a in a nutshell and say how do you improve your quality of sleep the first thing that we really need to know is what is called as a wind down routine okay you have to wind yourself down so you as a human being have been putting yourself through multiple uh, challenges through the day when you wake up your challenges in yourself with multiple tasks putting your brain through multiple levels of uh, activity now what can happen is that all this activity can can result in one thing not allowing your brain to switch off you cannot switch off so what happens is your sleep suffers but then from the beginning of this talk we were talking about how important sleep is and so we are not able to reach your destination which is sleep right so how do you, how does one help himself to get into that destination the first thing in winding down routine is you start changing your habits right you come home and here this is common for men and women i mean it's whether it is a homemaker or it is an office going person whether you are a sport person or you are uh, you are a professional you are whatever you may be you come home you have to basically take it down do not hit the gym late in the evening yes. that has a negative uh, impact on your ability to go to sleep a common thing that people would think is i will tire myself out but going to the gym late night can stimulate your brain so much that you cannot switch it off so the first thing that you will do in terms of winding down routine is to cutting down your caffeine input from around 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon your last coffee in the form of caffeine should be maximum about about 3 or not beyond that because of the half life of caffeine that can actually go for about 12 hours you may not understand that a lot of us will say that yeah we have like a late night coffee Uh, after a heavy dinner that would actually do the same that an alcohol binge would do in the night so having late night dinner having caffeine later in the later parts of the day doing aggressive physical exercise later part of the day binging on alcohol later part of the day and this is very interesting that i would like to bring this up is people think that having alcohol to go to sleep is the worst thing that one can do to their sleep 
So we will talk about that in the next uh, segment. But um, what is also sleep hygiene is in addition to avoiding all those things, you have a bath which could be just a, a nice uh, warm water bath, not a cold water bath. Again, because cold water bath would release dopamine in your brain, which can actually stimulate, stimulate your brain. Yes. Right? Have a warm water bath. Get into clothes that are very comfortable for you. Try to actually get a book to read, not do what we do, uh, getting on to social media, trying to look at all the reactions that you posted throughout the day. Try to read a book or a Kindle for that matter, which is not too bright, because the idea is not to have blue light into your brain, because light is very, very stimulating to your brain. That's why when you wake up in the morning, you should have light exposure. It's not in the night, but blue light does that. So when you look at uh, your, your mobile or your cell phone in the night, and you're scrolling through all the things out, reading a fiction book for that matter, that also can stimulate uh, activity in the night. A murder mystery, you would not want to put that book down. Because you want to know what's happening next. So, also, the temperature of the room. It's very important. It's better to keep the room a little cooler than what is... Uh, because it's very difficult to sleep in a hot room. So, all of these winding down routines would help to actually uh, put your sleep in order. So that you can have a restful sleep. I'm afraid of one of our physical education teachers during school who used to spend as much time on the cooling down routine after exercise as he used to spend time warming up. And he used to make sure that all of us cool down after that exercise. It is properly, if, if properly done, would give you the kind of sleep that you want. And the satisfying sleep and when you wake up in the morning, the pleasure that you get to sort of get that day when you had a restful sleep is an amazing feeling. I think all of us should try doing sleep hygiene measures in yes. the right way that uh, we just talked about. And uh, I think this requires building a habit. Yes. Getting into a more where you actually devote a lot of attention, devote a lot of importance to sleep that it actually should get and should not consider it in just a passing manner. Sleep should be on uh, one of the, should occupy one of the top most priorities. Yes, a lot of people and, and I, I remember myself reading quotes like, sleep is a luxury that somebody who wants to succeed in life should not have. I mean, these are the, these are the worst kind of statements that are put out um treating it is not a luxury exactly sleep is a necessity it is as important as drinking water or um, sleep is a necessity it should not be taken lightly anyway. absolutely and if you want to live long if you want to have a peace of mind if you want to have uh, avoidance from all the diseases that we talk about i think we should invest in a good healthy sleep Straight away. I think that's a fantastic thing. Investing in sleep, investing on yourself is the best investment. So now we should talk about uh, consequences of yes. sleep. Yes. 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 Then we can uh, talk about poor sleep hygiene also. Yes. Let's take a five minute break. Yeah, sure. So sir, we have talked about what is sleep apnea, what are the causes of sleep apnea, how to diagnose sleep apnea. But say, I choose not to get it treated, I choose not to get it diagnosed. What exactly happens in the sleep apnea? What are the consequences of untreated sleep apnea? So, primarily, as we discussed in the earlier section of our talk, the problems that come because of untreated sleep apnea is along the lines of three basic issues. One, because of stress resulting in the HPA axis, which is hypothalamic pituitary axis, and cortisol and so on and so forth. Number two, 
the effort that your lung is putting in to get oxygen into the body, resulting in autonomic dysfunction. Three, the effect on immunity. And the effect of inability of oxygen to reach the different destinations that it wants to get in, in the body. And last but not the least, the effect of carbon dioxide retention in the body. Now, these manifest in the form of two basic problems that we spoke about, the neurobehavioral problems and the cardiorespiratory problems, broadly speaking. The neurobehavioral problems are, one, excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue. In fact, the patients actually say, I am tired of being tired and that's the word that they use. You are tired of being tired. Morning brain fog and in the obsessive compulsive need to take naps during the day yes uncontrolled migraines and cluster headaches in men uh, problems relating to much more uh, bigger issues like PIA or transient ischemic attacks strokes so on and so forth if these are the neurobehavioral problems that come in, the cardiorespiratory problems that come in are one uncontrolled hypertension. In fact, 40% of patients with hypertension, they may have sleep apnea. Problems relating to rhythm of the heart like arrhythmias, fibrillation, so on and so forth. And because of excessive cortisol use, uh, cortisol release, uncontrolled uh, diabetes, problems relating to libido, that means impaired sexual function, erectile dysfunctions, infertility issues, and uh, last but not the least, there is almost 90% chance of a nighttime heart attack that can happen during uh, for an uncontrolled uh, uh, or an undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. We have heard stories about these celebrities yes. who have passed away in their sleep or in early morning. Nobody knew what exactly happened. The hypothesis that we have is perhaps they suffered from an untreated sleep apnea. See, that is the problem, right? You are oblivious to what is happening during your sleep. Hence, you don't raise a red flag and hence what you know is what will what you will test for. So how can you test something that you don't know? Right? And that is the scary fact. So unless you pick up the morning manifestations of what is happening to this particular individual, hence it's very important that you extract the history from the sleeping partner. Let it be a parent. If the if the client is a is a uh, is a kid. Or, uh, or a sleeping partner, if uh, the wife or a husband, if the client is an adult, it is imperative that we get the data from these people who are watching the client in question to understand the behavior uh, so that we can actually evaluate these patients. Which one of you is not brush aside your sleeping partner's complaints when they tell you that you do snow at night and if you are facing daytime problems as well along with snoring get yourself evaluated as soon as possible because this can actually result in marital problems you know uh, more often than not there are lots of clients that we see who are just uh, not able to sleep in the same room because of this particular problem so it's not enough for the sleeping partner to be thrown out uh, but it is also important that the person sort of takes up that client's problems and address it by evaluating this basic problem. Yes. To the number of uh, complaints, uh, the manifestations that you said, by adding depression, yes, yes. certain tendencies, yes, and uh, a tendency, a tendency to sleep while driving on the way. Yes. An increased risk of road traffic accidents, an increased rate of divorces, 
All these manifestations do happen with sleep apneas. They go unaddressed. Uh, I have uh, read publications which say that how snoring is one of the most important cause of divorce in the westernized world. Yes. And very soon it is coming to us. Absolutely. Very soon it will be in India where snoring will be a leading cause of divorce. Right now we are all protected by the social fabric of India, but very soon uh, snoring and all these problems are going to hit us. And, uh, I remember reading one of the studies, one of the data from one of the trauma centers, which evaluated sleeping problems amongst the uh, people who have met with accidents. And how they said that these patients who had accidents had a three to four fold higher chance of uh, having sleep complaints than a normal person. So it's every chance of decreased attention, uh, exactly. chance of sleeping on the wheel and then uh, meet, meeting with an accident with sleep apnea. Uh, that is a uh, that is a I think that's a perfect time for you to bring up this discussion. I think because what is happening because of the stress during the night is the person's reaction time is changing. Yes. The it takes a split second. So if your brain is not working at its best, you may be a school bus driver, you may be the pilot of a plane or you may be a surgeon, or you may be a, a big CEO, and if your reaction to a particular problem is not up to its mark, you are going to take suboptimal decisions that would, that would sort of affect the lives of many people that are depending on you. So, this kind of problem that is why in the west even for a simple driving license if you are somebody who's applying for a truck license for that matter or a school bus license a sleep study is mandatory for you to get and the sleep study has to be redone and re, uh, so that the, the license is re-evaluated so uh, i think there, there has been a, a major accident i can recall in the uh, in our area uh, about a school bus driver so what was happening was these are the times of the uh, unmanned railway crossings so this person actually saw the train at a distant uh, uh, like at, at the horizon he saw the train coming this is a school bus this guy is the driver and he's got a lot of school children there and so he's calculated that if he drives at that particular speed, he would cross that railway crossing with his all his experience. But now, he is probably having some kind of a sleep breathing disorder which has clouded his judgment. And ultimately, he has misjudged the speed at which he should cross that crossing. Unfortunately for him, the train his decision making did not tell me a lot of kids died because of wrong judgment by this particular driver. And it's not his fault. Nobody wants to kill school children. But it's because of his problem that he didn't he did not calculate it properly and his brain did not have the capability to calculate it properly that these children died. I think uh, some of the airlines have started uh, doing sleep studies for uh, their pilots as part of the commercial licenses, but they do it only if the person is above a BMI of 33. Yes. Do you think that needs a rectification? And I think this is a discussion, this is a follow up to the discussion we had in that fireside chat, and I'm, I'm very glad you brought this up. I've done a little bit of reading and uh, uh, data mining in terms of this. Uh, again, we should stop putting this one size fit all kind of a proposal. See, this is something that has been there for the West. And we do not fit into the guidelines of the West. In fact, if you look at Asian guidelines for, uh, for BMI, we are 23. If you say that according to Caucasian, the BMI is 25 and that is considered normal, it is considered normal for that race. For our race, that is not the right metric of measure. And hence, 
BMI for 23 is our peak. So if you, uh, it's too late, you're doing too little, too late. By then, the, the already the secondary compensations have already come in and the problem has already set in. You are, uh, the fire is already burning. And if you take a hose pipe to, uh, to sort of uh, combat a forest fire, you are not going to succeed. So I think a BMI of 33 is uh, too it's high. Too a high. Mark. Yes. And uh, maybe let's start by advising a sleep study to all the commercial pilots, all yes. the commercial heavy motor vehicle drivers, because they have many lives at stake. Probably in an ideal world, we should have a sleep study for everybody who is driving a vehicle. Correct. But at least we should start by uh, the major players. We should start with the. the uh, pilots and the heavy motor vehicle drivers have with them a lot of responsibility, a lot of lives at stake. I think it is, and recently we had a major train accident in Odisha. Uh, Balasore. Yeah, in Balasore. Where, so we really don't know where the uh, mistake is. Now, was this, uh, was, was, is there a benefit of uh, uh, human error? Uh, we should probably really consider all these things because there are lots of lives at stake. And imagine this is all human lives, right? What about implications on the financial se sector? Each one of these guys are responsible for billions of rupees and they are probably sitting on it and it, their judgment is clouded. One simple error in your judgment can cause if you are excessively daytime sleepy, instead of taking this call, you take that call, it could affect lives as well through the finances. Is that the reason uh, people who uh, are stressed, who are at the very uh, high level positions, is that the reason that these guys smoke a lot, uh, smoke, lo smoke a lot or uh, drink their caffeine a lot? Is that the reason? So, so probably here, what you are trying to do is to compensate for the excessive daytime sleepiness. You are gunning your uh, your caffeine intake or your nicotine intake. What you are now doing is you are burning yourself on both ends. And hence, you would burn faster. Your burnout rate is faster. Ultimately, you are failing as an individual. Yes. So, we cannot go against mother nature. Sure. One third of our lives are meant for sleeping, then they are meant for sleeping. You cannot just do away with that one third uh, part of your life when your body needs it. So, I think the if you are an individual who is requiring more drugs to control your hypertension, if you are somebody whose your diabetes is not coming under control despite the kind of efforts that you are putting in, if you are somebody who is excessively daytime sleepy, who is somebody who is requiring frequent naps during the day, if you are fatigued during the day and, and not to sort of take away all the manifestations, what are called as functional somatic disorders, which are fibromyalgias, myofascial pains. These are all various manifestations that sleep apnea sort of manifest sense. So, please take care of the symptoms that are coming in, pay attention to them, get your airway evaluated, get a sleep study and then do what is right for yourself. So, uh, what do you suggest? What do you suggest to our viewers? In case uh, somebody does uh, see a commercial pilot or a commercial uh, heavy motor vehicle and is at a critical position, what do you suggest to these people who are decision makers? Should they introduce a sleep study for all these pilots? That, in fact, would be something that I would really like. But what you can do at your end is use technology. Nowadays, you have your smart watches, you have your rings, which are, and these data are validated with polysomnography. And and you have your apps on your phones that are beautifully recording your uh, your sleep. I mean, the watch is is giving you so much data. Even 
uploading these small things using this particular app or these variables can actually sensitize you to say, hey buddy, there's something wrong with you. Get further evaluated. These, where we are today in 2023, the variables are at that level, wherein you are at least, uh, uh, you should be sensitized to the fact that if the data is showing you something, you have to listen to it and, and sort of uh, get medical attention. So all the discussion till now has been about say uh, a male patient of 40 or 50 year old who is suffering from snoring and sleep apnea problems. This has been the prominent discussion till now. But I would like to now steer this discussion towards some specific populations. Let's start off by uh, talking about children. How do they manifest their sleep apnea problems? What happens to them? So, it is now very clear in all, uh, all our branches of medicine that we stop treating children as young or baby adults or you don't want to do your dosages by two or by three and treat them. Sleep apnea in children is a different condition. The way it manifests is very different. The pathology that's happening inside is different. The end product is again very different. If you talk about sleep apnea in children, this can actually start even as a neonate. And because children sleep, a neonate is sleeping throughout the 24 hours. It's actually as you keep going into an infant that the sleep starts going down. So if the child is having breathing issues as a baby, as a neonate, this can manifest differently. So let's just divide this into uh, breathing, sleep related breathing issues as a neonate, as an infant, as a child, as a, as a teenager. And as the age progresses, sleep apnea again manifests very differently. So let's start with a neonate. How will a neonate actually have breathing issues? If you have, and we were talking about the upper airway and how the upper airway uh, starts from the nose to the lung. Now, if the upper airway is not able to keep itself open in a particular neonate because of lack of maturity of the nervous system and its ability to keep its upper airway open, whether it is happening at the level of the tongue, because the tongue is sort of falling backwards for various reasons or the maturity of the nervous system is not too much to keep the voice box open as a neonate, yes. that will increase the work of breathing on the lung for that tiny baby. Yes. Now this tiny baby is now working against a blocked upper airway. It, all of that is not going to go silently. This can be one of the reasons for silent deaths that happen in infant in in uh, in infants and neonates. The what we call a sudden infant death syndrome. Yes. Right? No explanations given. We don't know why those things happen. You put them under the genre. We do know that breathing problems. Exactly. What is happening as a consequence of that increased work of breathing is the load on the heart. Because what is happening because of this severe intrathoracic negative pressure is the, the load on the heart is increasing. The pulmonary artery pressure increases. The pulmonary artery pressure in these tiny babies have, have major repercussions. And this is Constantly, if it's happening, that can be a problem. Right? Now, if that is what is happening in a neonate, if you come to, to an infant, you are dealing with a different problem altogether. In an infant, the child's sleep characteristics will change. Yes. The child's a simple thing like maybe a tongue tie can cause a problem in breathing, as well as can cause a problem in latching on 
will feed. And that is the reason for all the new uh, hue and cry about tongue tie. And earlier we used to only think that tongue tie can have problems only in articulation. That is our failure to understand the impact of tongue tie on breathing because if the tongue is tethered to the lower jaw, it prevents the development of the upper jaw and so affects the way air flows and that's a different uh, discussion for an, uh, that's a huge discussion that's again a huge discussion. that's a huge discussion so the implications of that so we need to sensitize our neonatologists and our pediatricians who and the parents to the effects of this problem so one in an infant you may have problems uh, because of obstructions happening at the level of the upper airway from uh, problems which are tone related or tongue tie related. Now, coming to the child, the child manifests differently in the form of snoring because this is the age where the lymphoid, lymphoid tissue takes a leap in terms to in, in, like the, our tonsils, our adenoids, they take a leap to because these kids are now going to school and the airway needs to be protected, the body needs to be protected. So naturally, their lymphoid tissue takes a leap and this is when the children come with snoring problems, breathing problems, having restless uh, sleep and the children having poor kind of, so these kids, they come to your uh, OPD chamber and then you know that they are just restless. They are throwing the stuff on the ground. They are becoming high. They are either very hyper or they are going to school and they are sleeping. So, instead of uh, excessive daytime sleeping, as that we talk about in adults, children manifest a very different spectrum of behavioral issues, being hyperactive and irritable. And these parents uh, just dismiss them being. Aggressive. Very active child, you know, that's the word. Oh, my child is very active. Exactly. And they are gone in a, going in a different direction. It has been shown that a majority of the pay, children being diagnosed as ADHD actually have a sleep relating breathing disorder at the core of this condition. Do you think uh, the numbers of sleep apnea in children are just rising? This, uh, is, is it an epidemic? In fact, to answer that question, Anupam, the other corollary that I would like to bring in is allergy. The kind of lifestyle and the food that our children are exposed to. I would be, I'm, I'm, uh, the screen time, all the time. And, and both parents are working, the kids come home, they have nothing else to do but to get onto the gadget. Processed food is another problem, especially things with milk. And I would really like to bring uh, to our viewers' attention that most of our Indians are actually lactose intolerant. You will be surprised. Yeah? I'd also like to bring this uh, uh, fact that which mammal after they are born require milk to grow yet we have our parents the grandparents and are forcing our children to drink milk because so what happens to the body another mammal right so will the body take it no it won't and what is that other mammal getting in order to produce so much amount of milk, oxytocin, steroids, to give that particular milk. And that milk, you are forcing your kids to have, not oblivious to the fact that that particular milk that that other mammal is producing, secondary to all the steroids that were given, what will the impact be? These inflammatory foods, will cause inflammation in the body, resulting in lymphoid growth, irrational lymphoid growth. And where are they? 
at the at behind the nose at the level of the adenoids at the level of the tonsils and the level of the lingual tonsils so if you really look at energy is on the rise because of air pollution so what is the best way a child can respond immune system can respond by making the adenoids and tonsils big and making a sleep apnea very common in this age group so now we are talking about processed foods i think it's the right time to uh, talk about millets yes 2023 is the international Ye year of millets and probably is the food that our ancestors as indians used to eat yes and probably we have forgotten all that in westernized uh, culture that yes. we have so fast adapted to and uh, do you think that eating soft non chewed foods do develop a shortened jaw and predispose a child to sleep apnea exactly and uh, this is uh, uh, i think very well uh, sort of described in the book uh, called jaws wherein they have compared the primitive skull and the post industrialist skull and they have seen how the skull has changed because of the how we eat and once the skull changes where are all our muscles for breathing and swallowing attached to the skull so if you have a narrow long elongated skull because of all our breathing and chewing habits you will still have a very narrow airway and a narrow airway is a more collapsible airway a collapsible airway is a recipe for disaster <laughs> So many cases of bacteria wisdom teeth. Yes. Because our jaws just don't have the space to grow them. Yes. But where will they go? They have to erupt. Yes. So they are. Yes. And that is why there is so much of TMD pain. There is so much of dental pain. And for us as ENTs, they come with ear pain. And you will see there is nothing there. And now that we actually spoke about uh, manifestations and consequences, another very important uh, uh, factor that comes because of disturbed breathing is bruxism bruxism is something that comes in children and also we should discuss in women as a very very strong uh, manifestation of flow limitation of air and once these people are bruxing constantly it is resulting in tmd and this again is a major problem because tmd can manifest as a neck pain to to hemicranial pain to a pain that doesn't respond to anything and ultimately you're landing up doing surgeries on the tm tmj not knowing why it happened in the first place yes so bruxism is another very important symptom that these children manifest yes. So we have talked about pediatric age group now. Let's shift our focus to women. Yes. So uh, a typical snoring cartoon, if you see inside your newspapers or in, or on internet, is seen of a woman clutching a pillows over her ears when her husband is snoring. Yes. Why is that? Why is that snore, sir? Why? What protects? Her? I am very glad you brought this topic up. See, we have been stereotyping ourselves with the typical male uh, person, obese person with, uh, with uh, a snoring problem. And we have been, okay, OSA means that every person has that in their subconscious mind. Uh, image like, image uh, so, like that. And, and unfortunately, because see what the mind knows, the eyes see. And we were also asking the same questions to everybody. But as you know, one size doesn't fit all. This disease, which is sleep apnea, does not manifest the same way in different people. And we have seen this in COVID. COVID does not manifest the same way in every individual. We have seen it manifesting in a myriad of ways. Similarly, if you really look at sleep apnea and its manifestations in women, 
In fact, sleep apnea causes different kind of symptoms in women. If you really look at how it manifests, the commonest way is fatigue. In women, it is mostly brain fog, fatigue, excessive daytime sleepiness, being uh, tired throughout the day, working. If you are even a homemaker, because the women uh, of the modern era is is actually is a super person, you know. They are taking multiple jobs at the same time. Yeah, the person might be a doctor, might be a financial advisor, but in addition, she is becoming a mother. She is also becoming a, 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 a parent for uh, the older, uh, the, the parent of this particular mother. So, this particular individual is doing multiple multitasking to its to the fullest, you know, it's a, so, if this person is not able to sort of deliver it because the person is having fatigue, the person is having excessive daytime sleepiness, the person is having infertility issues, the person is having anxiety, the person is having breath syndrome. This is how a sleep apnea manifests in women. Very different to the way a man would respond. So, why were they the forgotten sex when it comes to sleep apnea because we were not asking the right questions because we are having this stereotypical mind to ask do you snore no a woman doesn't snore that much do you do you have uh, are you obese no most women are not obese when it comes to sleep apnea how it manifests post menopause is again very different because Estrogen, I mean, it, it protects the women till menopause in terms of muscle tone and so on and so forth. But once the woman hits uh, menopause, the symptom manifestations become very similar. But till then, do women not get sleep apnea? Yes, they do. And I said as in the earlier uh, report and uh, Dr. Abhishek's uh, paper also says the same. That women manifest, uh, the women, the percentage of women in India having sleep apnea is staggering. So, women do get some protection from the traditional snoring complaints that their male counterparts have. Yes. Till menopause. Yes. After that, it's the same. It's the same. And before menopause, you cannot ask the standard questions that we ask the male. You should ask the right questions so that. You know, things like amenorrhea, problems with uh, uh, with menstrual cycle uh, irregularities, problem uh, uh, problems with fatigue, problems with facial pain, problems with uncontrolled migraine, problems with TMJ. This is the, these are the right questions to ask women. A lot of these women uh, who are tired during the day, who get uh, fatigued during the day, they do get diagnosed by some uh, say less qualified individuals as low BP individuals. Yes. Ultimately, when you work them out, it's like uh, either they have anemia or they have sleep issues. Yes. Or they have uh, some high patient pain disorder. Yes. So, uh, what do you suggest to these women? So, what I would suggest that if there is some unexplained problem that you are facing, it could be just a simple neck pain. It could be uncontrolled migraine that is coming multiple times. We have no answer for. If there is an uh, a, a, a bruxism, your your teeth are you grinding your teeth unexplained, uh, and if you are fatigued through the day, getting tired with all the work that you are doing, definitely get your airway evaluated. There may be an undiagnosed sleep related breathing disorder at the core of all these symptoms and just diagnosing that and treating that can just solve all these problems in one single shot. Of course, you have to start practicing sleep hygiene then. Yes, of course, of course. With, with, because the modern women, like I said, uh, does multitasking. She's a mother, she's a parent, she's a uh, 
she's a, a, a financial geek, she's a, she's a doctor, she's a pilot. I mean, this is this hats off to the, uh, to the parent sex because uh, they can do such multitasking. Sir, we have talked about the onset of sleep apnea, the causes of sleep apnea, how does it manifest in various age groups, in various types of people, what are the implications of it. Let's turn to the treatment part. What is the primary treatment for sleep apnea? Does one size fit all? Do we have a standard treatment for sleep apnea? So, it's very interesting that you bring us this analogy of one size fit all. Um, unfortunately, I would like to bring you to an other analogy, which is our, our Panchatantra story, wherein there are four blind men actually trying to analyze an, an elephant, right? So one guy is looking at the trunk, one guy is looking at the feet, and he's thinking it's a pillar, and one side, is, one person is looking at the tail. So. We as specialists are doing that. It is very unfortunate. And that is the reason why we are trying to look at it in our own silos and trying to see uh, what is right for that particular, uh, in, in your own knowledge and your un own understanding. Now, the gold standard of therapy throughout the world is what is called as PAP therapy also known as positive airway therapy and there is nothing wrong with this um, but the problem with giving something which can be an answer for a, a myriad of mechanisms that are happening under the particular person's hood which is the human body how can it work all, uh, the same way do you do the same surgery for every particular problem, which is heart pain or uh, a heart attack? You do multiple things. So, evaluation is the key. However, the reason why sleep apnea is considered gold standard is primarily because it gives results. Right? When used, sleep apnea gives hundred. I mean, CPAP gives hundred percent results. Now, there are problems in terms of efficacy and effectiveness, right? Now, what is efficacy and what is effectiveness? Efficacy means in a lab, this particular modality works beautifully in an ideal setting. Who says the world is an ideal setting? And you are looking at a human being. And what is human nature? You say, even your child, you do this every single day. I will give you this particular curry and this particular food. Every day you eat it, they won't eat it. Let it be thyroid medicine, let it be uh, statins, let it be anti hypertensive medication. You tell the individual, the human boy, brain is ultimately a monkey. Right? We have evolved from our ancestors. If you tell it to do the same thing, the first thing to do is no, I want to do it. So, in an ideal setting, CPAP works well. That is efficacy. Now, effectiveness is real world data. What percentage of these patients for whom you have given the gold standard therapy are actually using it? So, if you look at the, the beautiful paper written by uh, Madeleine Ravenslot and uh, Nico Diviris, they actually put the numbers out there and said that if you are actually using CPAP for four hours a day and four hours and a human being which we all advise that you should sleep at least seven hours a day, that means what is happening to that extra three hours that you are not using the effective therapy? Now, all, does that mean the person is not having sleep apnea during that particular time? So, if let's break it down much more easier and say, supposing in a week you are using CPAP for three days and you are not using the CPAP for the rest of the three days, what is the effectiveness of the treatment? 50%. That means 
if you give a treatment for a somebody whose result is 50% what is happening to that efficacy of that efficiency of that treatment 50% i really loved it when you started off by saying that cpap gives you 100% results when used when used so that means when you use hundred percent of the times, you see results. But yes. Many of the patients use CPAP patterns. That is the biggest problem. CPAP companies uh, describe the success of CPAP, uh, the adequate usage of CPAP, as four hours a day, yes. five days a week. Yes. Breaking down, uh, breaking that down into numbers, that will be about twenty hours of usage in a week. Eight. When an individual is sleeping about 40, 40. 40 hours. That means 40% of the times if you are sleeping with CPAP, the company is giving you a clean chip saying you are a successful CPAP user. With that loose a definition, still the companies report CPAP compliance to be about 30% to 40%. Yes. Where are we in terms of effectiveness? So that is the problem with it. See, the problem here is lot of people are written in and given CPAP prescriptions, like how you given a vitamin tablet, you have given it, what is the follow up to all these patients, right? Who is really following your patients up? Some of them buy it, it's like your exercise cycle that stays inside your house, it's there, but a lot of them don't use it. Some people use it and it delivers, there's no doubt about it. It is a fantastic uh, a tool and the algorithms that they have nowadays, the way it can pick up apneas, the way it can pick up uh, uh, kind stokes respiration, the way it can pick up central sleep apnea, brilliant, hands down. The algorithms are beautiful. But the pro, it's like having a car, my car can do this, my car can do that, my car can actually show lights in the turning, my car can auto navigate, okay. But when you drive it, right? If you don't drive that car, what is the point in having all those bells and whistles if you can't use the bells and whistles? Right? So if you so this is for the individual, you can use the CPAP, great. You are using it, awesome. But if please be wary that if you don't use that, you are not being treated for the condition. Whether it is hypertension, it is the, the diabetes, whether it is any problem. If you don't use the prescribed treatment, you are not getting treated. Sometimes you just can't blame the patient for not using the machine. There are issues with those patients that predispose them to yes. use the machine at all. They become intolerant to the machine. And then what happens? They just drop off the treatment. Yes. And where does that... Uh, place the patient in the term, in terms of treatment, the treatment is zero. So actually, if you really look at a, a care providers like us who give uh, the gold standard therapy, right? When you give, supposing you're giving an amazing car to a person, don't you think you should be uh, in, uh, I mean, knowing how worthy the driver is, yes. right? The worthiness of the car is as good as the worthiness of the driver. Right? Now, same analogy, if you give the gold standard therapy to a person who is unable to use it because of certain abnormalities in a person's upper airway, you are depriving the gold standard therapy because of your failure to evaluate his inability to use the CPAP. And we know now that structural problems in terms of narrow upper airway can cause inability for the person to not use the gold standard therapy. So, there is a beautiful paper that came out and got published in uh, 2018 or 19, I think, in the uh, American Journal of Otolaryngology. Wherein it's the first one month of the experience with the CPAP that determines the patient's adherence to the sleep, uh, to the CPAP. If you make that one month miserable for that patient, you have, the patient is going to disown the treatment for the rest of his life. So, it is upon us 
to make that experience good when you give CPAP. Yes. And what is that? To clear, to make the CPAP work for that individual. Yes. And we know that narrow airway is one of the commonest causes for lack of adherence to CPAP. See, this narrow airway is the part where surgery comes in. Yes. Surgery should not be viewed as something that is, uh, again, the one size fit all analogy. It's not for everybody. There are different surgeries available for people with custom uh, made problems. So, there are custom made surgeries for every patient. Yes. And uh, they do help, right? Yes. So, what happened when we thought one size fit all? When we applied U triple P for everybody, what happened? We failed. Evaluation is the key. Yes. Assessing the patient in the right manner and giving the patient a custom made surgery or an appliance will definitely help the patient overcome the problem of sleep apnea. If not, will definitely help the patient achieve a better compliance with sleep apnea and uh, achieve, a further, uh, achieve the goal of sleep apnea for that particular patient. There are a plethora of uh, treatment modalities that are available for the different kind of individuals that are there out there. All we need to do is try to sort of marry the problem and the patient's requirements and the ability to use that particular modality of treatment. And that is our job. If we fail to connect these dots, the patient, we have failed the patient. Yes. The blood is on our hand if we don't do that. So it's very important that we evaluate and we connect these dots properly. In the right amount of spice, in the right amount of curry, in the right amount of uh, wheat, and the right ingredients in the uh, preparation that we prescribe to the patient. Exactly. And I think. Because there are a myriad of uh, uh, sort of treatment options that are available for you, it is not up to only a single speciality to work on this. It requires all party uh, people who can actually contribute in this care. It can be an endocrinologist in terms of taking care of the hormonal problems. It can be the neurologist who will help us with the overlap syndromes. The psychiatrist, the pulmonologist, the dental, the orthodontist, the pediatrician and the ENTs who have to come together, join forces, stop thinking in our silos of, uh, uh, of, of our vision and stop being the blind people who are trying to analyze the elephant in our own ways, trying to open our eyes. One thing that I would really like to also say is that what the mind knows, the eyes see, but you will also see what the mind wants you to see. We should come out of our fixed ideas in our mind that CPAP is the only treatment or mandibular advancing device is the only thing or positional therapy. I will advise positional therapy to everybody or I will give CPAP to everybody. Evaluate whether this patient is fit for that treatment modality and Make the experience pleasant so that the patient can use this modality because OSA is a journey. You start the journey, there, there is a lot of hand holding that is required. You have given the CPAP and said, no, that's not the way. You cannot wash off this. In this journey that you have diagnosed for this patient, this particular condition, there may be many modalities of treatment that as the patient's caregiver that you are going to offer. You may be giving positional therapy. You may be giving a surgery. You may be giving a mandibular advancing device. Somewhere down the line, you may be giving a, a nerve implant. You may be doing multiple things. It is basically to own up that particular patient to and, and give what is right at that frame of time for that patient will do justice for them. Because not doing that, will give the patient so many conditions that we just spoke about and the blood is on our hands. So, uh, an interdisciplinary team action is what is required to treat yes. these patients.
and uh, they can present to all of us. Everybody, all the doctors need to be sensitized. And of course, and uh, multidisciplinary team action is required to treat these patients with a period of uh, devices, the appliances, the surgery that we have. And of course, uh, I think uh, the conclusion of this segment of our podcast is that one size doesn't fit all. all. And we have to provide custom made treatment to everybody and everybody. Do you think that pediatric age group sleep apnea does need more of surgical intervention rather than sleep apnea? So, see, in an adult, there is some margin of error. And this is to all of us uh, out there, the dental, the maxillofacial, the ENTs that are out there. There is no margin of error in pediatric because they are growing. It's a growing skeleton and we mess up somewhere. You, They cannot fall back and say, okay, you put on the CPAP. They won't use it. Okay? So if we have taken the wrong call for them, because you as a particular specialist are not experienced to deal with that particular problem. And if you are oblivious to the fact that, let's say, adenoids regress with time, right? Yes, they do. But will they for that particular patient? No. So, if oh, allergies can be managed uh, giving, giving uh, a nasal spray, for how long? What is the impact of long-term use of uh, intranasal corticosteroids on the HPA? So, every action has equal and opposite reaction. And these children are not only having metabolic issues because of their inability to breathe, they are having skeletal changes. They are developing long faces, developing... So, it is our failure as pediatricians not to pick up these children's children thinking that maybe age will take care of it. If we have an inability to diagnose these things properly, we should probably not do it and send it to an expert who can. Do you think that pediatric sleep apnea is the root, is the basis, is the foundation of adult sleep apnea? I would not agree more. There is, uh, it is uh, a major problem and because pediatric sleep apnea is actually raising higher than adult sleep apnea actually. So you, can, uh, you can just uh, extrapolate the data. We have an, uh, a burgeoning epidemic to deal with. Right now, if that number is about 900 million to 1 billion people on earth, just imagine the kind of burden we are growing for ourselves. It's and and they manifest differently. Some of these kids manifest as anxiety disorder, some of them as ADHD, some of them are taking rubbish medication for not for something which is not even that particular problem. So again, identifying, being clear about what the underlying mechanism might be in this particular individual. For example, if the child ha is having adenoid tonsils and obesity is the problem, right? In addition to just treating uh, just uh, tonsil and adenoid, you also will have to treat the obesity. If you don't do it, that's another problem. If Down syndrome child is there, and if the child is having adenoids and tonsils, just doing an adenoid tonsillectomy for a Down child is not going to cure the problem. The, the take home message is to own up these cases, take them to their logical conclusions in terms of evaluation and do what is right. So, in a lot of patients undergoing treatment uh, with various doctors, you know, they are suggested that you bring down your weight, you lose the weight, get rid of your obesity, then you will have a substantial relief from your sleep apnea patients, uh, sleep apnea symptoms. So, uh, do you think losing weight is that easy for these patients? So again, it is the same analogy as a hammer and a nail. You have a hammer in the hand, everything looks like a nail. You know how to lose, you want to lose weight for everybody. You will see, 
it's again the same thing like how we ENT surgeons did in the late nine, uh, early 80s and 90s. We hammered everybody with a with a U triple P and where that look where that got us 40 percent results. So if by if you want to lose weight and sleep apnea, if things were so simple, no. In fact, there is a lot of data in the pediatric literature that some there is residual OSA in about 30% of these obese patients who were treated with bariatric, whether it is bariatric endoscopic surgery or bariatric uh, lap surgery, 30% of patients uh, still have residual OSA. What is that telling you? Sleep apnea is a syndrome. The mechanism may be different in that particular individual. Maybe the patient has a overlap issue with obesity being a, so you have reduced the oxygen demand, you have reduced the parapharyngeal fat patch, but what about the rest of the upper airway, what have we done to improve its, uh, so again thinking that every patient will do well with weight loss again is a wrong concept. Also, for these guys, weight, losing weight is not that easy, right? Yes, it's they not. Have it all the time. Yes. How come you expect them to exercise when they're just not feeling well sitting in a chair? Also, uh, we know the leptin and the adrenaline axis. Leptin is the uh, satiety hormone. It's just uh, work they work for these patients. Exactly. They don't have any sense of satiety. So, uh, if a sleep apnea patient, Keep eating. What do you expect these guys to lose weight? To lose weight, exactly. So losing weight is not the answer for every sleep apnea. Again, to bring your earlier analogy that is the male fat uh, person. No, it can affect you. It can affect me. It's just that it's manifesting differently. And uh, what do you think? Is this uh, syndrome where we say diabetes, hypertension? Central obesity, the syndrome should should be expanded to include sleep apnea in its umbrella. I really think that's a wonderful concept that you've got. Uh, I think we call it uh, metabolic syndrome, syndrome X. And uh, I think because looks like sleep apnea is a common denominator for all these conditions. So why not just use it? We should be uh, looking at addressing uh, sleep apnea in all the patients who possibly can have it and uh, we should be actively looking for it. Yes. So the cardiologist has uh, in the earlier times used to say that there are four horsemen of heart attack, mm. uh, uh, deranged cholesterol profile, diabetes, hypertension and uh, Yes. So the cardiologists in earlier times used to say that there is cholesterol, diabetes and hypertension but the common denominators amongst all the heart attacks perhaps sleep apnea can be that additional denominator an additional factor that needs to be uh, settled. settled. I think uh, whatever it is, it is manifesting differently to different specialists. It is up to them to sort of clear the clutter which is on top of the basic problem which is sleep apnea to see clearly because just treating a symptom is, is, is not going to solve the basic problem which is uh, the, the, the deep pathophysiology. See, another aspect that I would really like to bring now here is for most of us, we measured sleep apnea in the form of a metric of measure called AHI, which is an oversimplistic kind of a measure saying that, okay, you have AHI of X, Y and Z, not really understanding in depth what it is doing to this particular person in terms of quality of life. We have a lot of these patients with uh, OSA. If you look at their compliant report, their AHI is cured with their CPAP. But patients come back and say, Doc, that is correct. This is the report you gave me. I am agreeing with you. But I am still tired throughout the day. I am still fatigued. What are you going to do about it? So these are some unanswered questions when you are 
trying to oversimplify a very complex problem such as sleep apnea and trying to measure it with AHI. Well, of course, that's another topic for another discussion wherein how AHI is, is uh, actually an oversimplistic uh, uh, way of uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, you know, measure sleep apnea. So, uh, let's uh, close this. Let's talk about the basic. Uh, yes, research. sure, sure, sure. So, I think uh, we'll be discussing uh, that he goes down with having a toxin. Yes, yes. And, uh, treating sleep apnea being a waste of money for people because sleeping, that is a red flag. Keeping the food in the mouth for some time and not keeping my making monkey bags for some it's a pediatric sleep that's fine we'll talk now uh, so we'll talk about uh, myths yes we should uh, talk about breastfeeding versus breastfeeding and bottle feeding yes yes why not uh, monkey bagging, mm. uh, drooling, 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 drooling. Mouth taping again is a again chin strap has problems with the uh, Let's not keep that. Mouth taping also will not do, but take it to a dental doctor is what we will say. Let's do uh, myths and misconceptions. Yes, yes, yeah, let's do this. So, misconceptions regarding sleep apnea. So, let's start off. Soon. Uh, a lot of people think that getting their child treated with adenoids and uh, non selecting surgeries will bring down the child's immunity. Is that true? So, actually, there you will have to view it in the form of a risk and benefit. Yes, there will be some amount of um, in lack of immunity once you take out something which is actually giving you immunity. Now, you can't take it just like a statement. Number one, we need to look at it at what age are you really doing this, number one. And more importantly, what is the impact of those adenoids and tonsils staying there in the upper airway, causing sleep related breathing disorder, causing recurrent infections because of the biofilms in the adenoids and tonsils, causing recurrent problems on a daily basis. Now, the second uh, concept that you will have to really look at is what is the impact in terms of form and function of the upper airway that these things are doing if left alone. Right? Now, it's very interesting that if you were to leave the tonsils and adenoids which are very big in size and they are on a constant basis, it is increasing the work of breathing for the child, it is going to have some impact. Now, if you leave it and say that um, that there is a problem in terms of uh, the child is going to grow out of it. When will the child grow out of it? At 13 and 15. Meanwhile, what is the impact of all of that on the child on a daily basis? What about the cytokine relief? What about the oxidative stress? What about the effect it is having on the child's heart? All of this will not be left alone. So, you really need to look at, you are actually thinking in quicksand and if you are asking for help and you pull out, what is the, uh, uh, what can happen? Maybe, uh, do you want to sink in that quicksand and take that benefit of doubt of once I come out, maybe a tiger will eat me, first you come out of the quicksand. Then you can think about whether the tiger will come and eat you or no, because right now, you are thinking on a, on, on, on a minute to minute basis and thinking that, okay, if I come out, tiger might come and affect me, so I will sink. 
that is not an analogy and that is what the analogy that lot of parents and pediatricians have i get reminded of another analogy that i heard long back it said that a dustbin is a place where you throw in your garbage just because that that dustbin uh, gets filled and is not functioning anymore doesn't mean that you keep that dustbin in place exactly you have to take it out right yes it's not serving its function yes. exactly so the dirty tonsils if they are not serving their function anymore that just causing you a little bit trouble then why bother exactly. why keep them in place and further uh, cause those anomalies yes can you and you which are irreparable which are irreparable it will ultimately lead you to other shit up exactly so uh, let's talk about another misconception sir uh, it says uh, a bottle fed child is not at a higher risk of sleep apnea with yeah. that so a lot of problems with that in terms of orofacial growth the growth of the naso maxillary complex and also the effect it's having in terms of immunity uh, a mother's milk is rich in in uh, immunity booster it can actually protect the baby and give a lot of immunity and that's of course needless to say and everybody knows that what people don't know is the fact that just breastfeeding and the actions that come with it and the action of the tongue which is the biggest organ in the mouth and the impact that it can have on the growth of the naso maxillary complex is just uh, you cannot imagine the amount of benefit that it can get this neuromuscular coordination that just simple breastfeeding can initiate in a child can have repercussions later in life so i highly would encourage uh, breastfeeding as long as they can um, and in terms of immunity in terms of myofascial growth in terms of jaw growth the development of the upper jaw and the movement of the tongue which are very very important for further uh, growth of this child so breastfeeding has to be done breastfeeding is uh, perhaps can we say that breastfeeding is the protective uh, agent or a protective force against sleep apnea especially yes. in part of child it is, we are putting in lot of the vaccines to prevent our children from lot multiple diseases i mean breastfeeding itself can is is like a vaccine for a child who may develop sleep apnea in the future because of poor uh, oromuscular dysfunction and a uh, muscular failure and a uh, failure of the proper growth of the uh, nasal maxillary complex so a lot of people a lot of parents don't realize the effect of soft processed foods and the use of screen time on their children in terms of what this uh, what is that uh, there the impact on breathing and what is the impact on sleep cycles yes let's talk about so in order to sort of understand that we need to understand that the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose they are not two different entities now the 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 tongue has a very very important function as the most the biggest organ in the oral cavity for it to be where it needs to be now i would I would urge the our, our spectators just to close their mouth and see if they if they are able to feel the entire upper jaw. If they are not feeling their upper jaw, it's basically telling us that the uh, the tongue and the upper jaw are not fitting into each other, and this is called loss of coupling. Right now, this has a uh, has has lot of consequences and. if the upper jaw is not being guided by the tongue the upper jaw keeps going higher and higher and higher and we now know that the roof of the mouth which the upper jaw is is the floor of the nose so if the upper jaw is going up the bone which is in between which is which we call as the nasal septum would automatically bend and once the upper air uh, nasal septum bends 
the uh, a lot of us used to think that it is genetic or it is because of some trauma or it is birth trauma and things like that but that is not true most of us would also know that once you do a septoplasty they would say that if you do a pediatric septoplasty it will recur why that is because once you corrected it we failed to correct the root cause of the deviated septum in the child in the first place which is malformed upper jaw so the upper jaw continued to grow up because of mouth breathing continued mouth breathing because we did not address the upper jaw and the patient would have okay the child will have a septal deviation again which is again not true so treating the upper jaw by involving the pediatric orthodontist which uh, after uh, treating the nasal obstruction is imperative uh, to get a good outcome in terms of this particular condition and, uh, chewing of hard food yes is uh, what drives this jaw, jaw growth, growth after uh, the uh, child has been switched to uh, weaning and uh, has been switched to uh, other foods? Yes. So, uh, jaw growth requires traction, requires a lot of yes. training exercises, yes. which we are depriving our children because of uh, processed foods and sugary foods that we, we so easily get. And as an end result is a malformed jaws and this results in uh, that's just an uh, is a recipe for uh, sleep apnea and, uh, all these children uh, i see them uh, i observe them all the time they have this long face malformed upper jaw crowded teeth and uh, eater of processed food yes and uh, seeing their mobile screens like this Mouth breathing all the time and mobile screens. Exactly. Uh, the just... face would change. The way you are dealing with your food changes, the uh, so they don't even chew their food because they can't breathe properly. So either they're keeping food in their mouth for a very long time because they have to breathe and swallow through the mouth, or they're just gulping food. And hence they need processed food because they can't breathe. So what do we do? We fall for that and see okay the child requires more processed food and you keep giving things which are very soft, depriving them the, the uh, depriving them of the proper upper airway uh, evaluate, I mean growth. Um, so that is that. Let's mention and talk about the use of uh, screen time and the use of gadgets of these children. Do you think that this causes a lot of sympathetic stimulation yes. and uh, increase in oxygen demand of the body, further predisposing the child to mouth breathing? And also, having said all that, in addition, it can also affect on the cortical growth. The kids of this age, that particular age, their brains are like sponges. They absorb everything information, language, concepts. So if we deprive them of that and fill their brains with this junk, obviously the potential is being curtailed. What they would be uh, capable of, we are depriving of them of that and then we are the root cause for their failure. So uh, let's suppose sir that a child undergoes uh, adenoid and tonsil surgery or let's say an adult undergoes a palate surgery or a tongue based surgery for uh, uh, for uh, improving the sleep apnea symptoms. So, uh, does this surgery work in isolation or does this surgery, like orthopedic surgery, require a physiotherapist to help you out in the later part? I'm very glad you brought this topic up because without connect, without this topic, whatever you do is is a so it's like a tali not having a sweet dish at the end. Um, See, we need to understand that this is not just, uh, these are muscles, right? These are active muscles that need to function in harmony, not individually separated from each other, but in coordination as an orchestra. Now, once we fix the, uh, the uh, form, the function has to follow, right? Now, if we are clearing the obstructions, 
automatically for a child once you clear up the obstruction in the nose and the throat the brain won't switch off mouth breathing and start nasal breathing yes they have to unlearn mouth breathing and learn nasal breathing so in order to achieve that we need to do a a wonderful physiotherapy called myofunctional therapy there is a lot of data out there that even as a stand alone uh, technique of treatment it can reduce ahi which is the metric of measure of sleep apnea so every child or an adult that goes treat that they, that undergoes treatment for obstructive sleep apnea uh, whether surgically or non surgically or through a device needs myofunctional therapy there is no cutting that value of that myofunctional therapy shot to uh, bring the function back so this is like uh, training the child onto the right track yes once uh, you have uh, taken the child of the wrong track through a surgery or an intervention uh, getting the child to the right track requires a myofunctional therapy absolutely by bringing the jaw muscles the tongue muscles and the nasal passage in harmony with each other yes and, uh, causing the right airway growth yes and uh, a lot of emphasis is also laid on how our dental colleagues especially yes. the pediatric dentists and the orthodontists by keeping the teeth and the airway straight and help us in the post operative period by attending to these children yes. a lot of these children for obvious reasons because of mouth breathing have a lot of cavity issues yes yes yes, yes. Uh, and drooling and drooling so imperative uh, that we do seek Uh, consultations with the pediatric dentists yes therapists i mean the squares you all set in work it's always a team work so for those of our patients who have who are mouth breathers and this history is very important to be taken and we do an upper airway surgery whatever that may be to improve the breathing giving myofunctional therapy is or giving or following it up with our dental colleagues to see if we are doing the right see ultimately like i said just giving uh, some kind of a surgery or a device for that patient and thinking that it's all over is not right yes. we have to take these patients to their logical conclusion and yes. only then is what to have been called succeeding in the treatment Sir, we uh, need to understand that sleep is not a luxury. Sleep is a necessity for every human being. Number two, pediatric sleep apnea and women's sleep apnea is very different from in the way it manifests from adult sleep apnea. uh having a patient with snoring is not something that uh that you can be uh, oblivious to and just try to push it under the carpet it needs proper evaluation and treatment and send it to its logical conclusion surgery for uh, sleep apnea or uh, a device for sleep apnea is not meant for failure yet those days are gone every patient of sleep apnea should not be treated or cannot be treated by a single modality of treatment or just because you have one way of treating or you are the boss of one way of treating sleep apnea does not mean that that particular patient will only benefit from that particular modality to which you are an expert of identifying uh, children with sleep related breathing disorders children with hyperactive uh, hyperactivity children uh, uh, women with fatigue with functional somatic disorders which is another way of manifesting obstructive sleep apnea is important three understanding and fully uh, and collaborating with our colleagues whatever that particular uh, a uh, particular division of medicine it might be and 
owning up our patients and taking them to their logical conclusion is very important. I think we uh, have summarized everything that we discussed in a nutshell. And, uh, I'm sure a lot of the viewers uh, would have gained something out of this podcast. Yes. I'm sure a lot of uh, non-medical people and MBBS students have watched this podcast will learn something. I'm sure a lot of specialists can also learn from this podcast. Yeah. Let's hope uh, we get a lot of audience and a lot of people to watch this podcast. Do drop in your suggestions, do drop in your comments if you have any. And we will try to respond to as many people as possible. Do not, do not be hesitant to seek a medical advice if you feel something is wrong with your sleep because there are experts out there to help you out. On this note, I think we can uh, conclude this uh, podcast for today, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Anupam, for a fantastic uh, 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 kind of uh, being a very good host and trying to extract the maximum amount and trying to sensitize because the onus is on us. It is our job to do this. Uh, we all to the second episode of our sleep apnea series where we will be talking about special populations. Sleep apnea in an adult male is not the same as sleep apnea in a child or in a woman because of different reasons altogether. And uh, I am joined by Dr. Srinivas Kishore. I am Dr. Anupam, your host. And uh, I am a disciple, he is my guru. And we have been together for the last uh, one year or so. And uh, I have learned a lot of sleep apnea work from him. So he has years of experience about sleep apnea behind him. And let's learn it from him as to why women and children are different uh, with their sleep apnea problems. So when you talk about sleep apnea, sleep apnea does not present the same way uh, in every human being. Similarly, sleep apnea doesn't present the same way across genres or across age groups. So sleep apnea wears a different sort of uh, color when it comes to its manifestation in women. Now, if you were to uh, uh, take uh, as, uh, a similarity from how it presents in men, in men, it presents in the stereotypical way. You have the slightly chubby, obese man with your pseudoparotid hypertrophies, with a short chin, with a double chin, so on and so forth, having a lot of snoring, having pauses, during the snoring, having excessive daytime sleepiness in the morning. Now, if this is the stereotypical way how a sleep apnea presents in men, in women, it presents very differently. Now, in women, the presentations are of, of, of symptoms which are very similar to what we now call as functional somatic disorders. And what are functional somatic disorders? fibromyalgia, myofascial pains, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, all of these sort of come into those, uh, that particular category. Now, so what are the, uh, the different features with which uh, uh, women present with? Early morning headache, increased frequency of migraine, having fatigue throughout the day, having TMD problems because of bruxism, which is one of the commonest ways the body compensates during the nights in, uh, because of the inability to sleep. Orthostatic hypotension, that means if there is a 20 millimeters of mercury difference between when a patient is, when a person is uh, lying down or sitting and getting up in the blood pressure. In the blood pressure. Orthostatic hypotension and cold, having cold, clammy feet. These are the ways through which women manifest. So, if you are asking the history, do you snore? The woman would say, no, not that much. If the patient, if, are you obese? No, not that much. But the right thing is we need to ask these questions. So, uh, thank you for the wonderful podcast. I'm sure most of our viewers, whether it's a layman, a non-medical person, a student, or even a specialist, must have learned something out of this podcast today and uh, if we can drive home the message that sleep apnea is an unseen problem it's a public health burden we have done our bit for the day and just before we wrap up what are your take home messages 
for this women and pediatric sleep apnea podcast episode so women and children should be treated differently because they manifest differently we need to be asking the right questions pertaining to the way it presents in women and children and the management of especially pediatric sleep apnea cannot be extrapolated from what we know in an adult population these kids if we don't identify them early can grow into adult sleep apnics and there is a lot of uh, and every patient who is a mouth breather who comes to us with sleep apnea and in whom we have done an adenotoxicectomy should be followed by a pediatric dentist to treat the uh, the obstructive sleep uh, to the obstructive sleep apnea which can become uh, persistent even after clearing the adenotonsil because of abnormal jaw growth and in women it is also very important to uh, a sort of treat these patients with uh, myofunctional therapy after you have done what you have done to treat this particular uh, problem thank you sir thank you it was a pleasure hosting this podcast and i'm sure we i would have learned a lot and uh, our viewers have learned a lot thank you very much for uh, hosting this wonderful event and asking the right pertinent questions for uh, which is worthy of this uh, podcast so thank you. thank you we have discussed a lot about sleep apnea the cause of sleep apnea the consequences that it can have on the cardiorespiratory system on the neurobehavioral system the ways to diagnose it the ways to treat it uh, we have uh, all this uh, for our viewers just before we wrap up this podcast can you in a nutshell summarize the whole podcast for our viewers so we have basically spoken initially about what is sleep related breathing disorder the different kinds of sleep related breathing disorder the manifestations of each one of them we spoke in detail about the pathogenesis or the mechanism that happens when the patient has disturbed breathing the implications of disturbed breathing in terms of how the disease uh, sort of manifests in terms of symptoms and signs that we need to look for we've also spoken about the consequences of uh, untreated obstructive sleep apnea we spoke about how we sort of identify sleep apnea and the different methodologies that are there to evaluate this particular disease and offer the different treatments that are out there to customize the treatment to the particular individual because one size doesn't fit all and each every individual does not have the same way of manifesting the this particular disease hence we have to evaluate the right treatment to be offered to that particular individual so that the treat patient is treated successfully thank you so much for joining us in this podcast sir i'm sure a lot of people have heard us today a lot of laymen uh, non medical people a lot of medical students a lot of specialists also would have been something out of this podcast and uh, i think this is one of the first steps towards raising awareness regarding sleep apnea in this country which is a major public health burden as of now and uh, often gets ignored so uh, thank you so much sir and uh, i really uh, appreciate your time and effort towards this podcast thank you very much anupam for being an amazing host to write uh, to sort of bring out the right questions and trying to uh, improve the awareness uh, amongst uh, the laymen and also among uh, our medical uh, our medical fraternity as well across specialties thank you thank you so much